Check. is Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 694. Please stand as you are able and join in the singing of this hymn.
in the historic confession of the Christian Church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. I do want to invite at this time uh, Bobby and Amanda Baker, if they would come, and then also uh, Pete and Claire Berry, if y'all would come on up here. They're coming with their son, James Michael, and we have uh, Jennings and Miles helping out as well. If y'all would stand behind them. So you ready? We're, we're in a interrupting a morning nap uh see i'm awake now you ready so uh bobby and amanda and then and pete and claire ask you to take these vows on behalf of the whole church or ask you do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin if so answer i do and do you accept the freedom and power god gives you to resist evil injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, answer, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, answer, I do. And will you nurture James Michael in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, answer, I will. What name is given to this child? This is James Michael. And you have a part to play in this, to aid them uh, as they raise James Michael in, in a Christian home as the community of faith. Do you renew your faith in God, place your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and place your whole trust in his grace for salvation? If so, answer, I do. I do. And will you nurture James Michael in faith by loving and caring for him? Will you do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love? If so, answer, we will. James Michael, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May God's grace and mercy rest upon you all the days of your life. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to hymn number 191 as we sing together, Jesus Loves Me.
I told Bobby he's going to definitely have a firm handshake because he's got a death grip. Uh, <laughs> you join me in prayer. Oh God, what we pray, Lord, is that we, you would use us in a way to model uh, grace and mercy, to model love and everything that we do before him so that that is used and leveraged in such a way that he knows uh, fully and completely the deep love that you have for him. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today to thank you for your great love and mercy. When our love is shallow and our mercies are limited, your love is never ending and your mercies are new each morning. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings you've given us. Our gifts in return are often not our best. We've not given you the best portion of our time or our talents or of our earnings. As we prepare for the season of Advent, make us ever aware that it is a time of preparing our hearts for your greatest gift to us, that of Jesus Christ. May we take time to reflect on the precious gift of eternal life that Christ offers and open our hearts to live as faithful servants to give you our best, the best of our time, the best of our talents, and the best of our earnings. Guide us, Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is We Gather Together, hymn number 131. Please stand as you are able and join in the singing.
may be seated. Now let us worship God with his tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, all that we have is a gift from you. May we keep this in mind as we offer gifts to you. May we give joyfully and generously for your honor and your glory. Amen. scripture which comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 5 through 15. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and to arrange in advance for this bountiful gift that you have promised so that it may be ready as a voluntary gift and not as an extortion. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, 
He scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace God he has give, that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. We welcome you once again to St. Paul, and we ask that you register your attendance in the red pew pad and pass it down the aisle. And now, as the children come forward for the children's moment, please pass the peace of Christ with one another. We make it in Turkey. What else? We put it out and make it and make lion and make it and make lion. I can make it what? I can make a tree. Okay. It could be a tree. All right. Let's, I might have to learn. You have to teach me how to do that when the service is over. I'm not quite. I'm not sure how to do that. What are some of the things I can do with my hands? though? what are some of the things you can do with your hands? You can pick up stuff. What else? What's that? Cut. I could touch. That's where I could touch things. What else? What? I could cut things. I, I could maybe count. I could do, perform a magic trick. Yes, yeah, right. What, what else do you think I could do with my hand? I could touch it. That's right. How about, uh, do you ever work with your hands? You do? No, you don't work with your hands? How about your parents? You think they work with their hands? Yeah. All right. Well, okay, good, good. What else do you think I could do? I could extend my hand out to someone, right? To do what? Shake it. Oh. A high five. I could do a high five. Or I could hug. I could hug, right? Maybe. <laughs> when you get older, you're going to love hugs. I just want you to know. I could hug. I could extend. These are all ways of welcoming someone. I could color. That's right. I like I could make signs. Good. I make all kinds of signs. Uh, well, I could punch, but I would rather not punch. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, we don't want to do that. We could, I could climb trees, but there's all kind of things. I could. I could pull my teeth out. Yeah. Um, I could pick up a whole bunch of things. Right. Yeah. You know, there's so many things I could do with my hands. Right. Well, I wouldn't want to pull somebody's hair, because if not, your hair might be like mine. There's not much <laughs> So you don't want to, that's, that's what happens when you pull it all out. <laughs> yep, all the hair. There's so many things you can do with your hands. And part of what we do here, what we call ministry, when we talk about doing stuff in the church, so much of that involves our hands. 
And there are so many things. You've mentioned a whole bunch of those things. We could make things. We could pick up things. We could welcome things. things. Yeah, we could, but we don't want to, right? We don't want to do that because uh, that might get us in trouble, right? Yeah, that'd be bad news then. Then we'd have to go to the principal's office, wouldn't we? That'd be bad, yeah. And then we normally end up talking to mom and dad. Did that ever happen? Well, we don't, we don't want to do that. As much as that might sound fun, um, sometimes we get in trouble when we do that, right? So uh, we don't want to do that. But we can do all kind of other stuff with our hands. So let's do this. I want you to think. Yeah, you can make, make all kinds of things. Maybe today, maybe after church, think of some of the ways you could use your hands in a way that might help somebody else. All right? Think you can do that? All right. Well, let's, let's, let's ask God to help us. How about that? You ready? Can you pray with me? <clears throat> oh, God, what we pray, Lord, is that you would guide and direct us. And what we pray, God, is that you would help us to use our hands in ways that... Uh, that, that help not just us, that help another. And so part of what we do in worship is we give ourselves to you. And so use what we give in such a way that ends up blessing your name. And what we pray, Lord, is for your kingdom to come and to use our hands in that process. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.
I've added the aid to the sermon of a cough drop, and uh, I, after the early service, I was starting to lose my voice, and so I uh, used one at the nine o'clock service, and uh, midway through the sermon, about swallowed it while I was trying to preach, and uh, I didn't think a sermon could be hazardous to your health, um, but evidently it can in this case. Uh, so if you would please uh, pray with me. Oh God, what we pray now is that you would use the text that was read in such a way that it becomes the gospel. Uh, we know in order for that to happen, we rely on you, that it uh, not something inside of ourself that can generate that. And so we need your Holy Spirit to weave into the reading and the hearing in such a way that what's uh, processed and, and taken in is... Uh, something that leads to the nature of Christ from the inside out. Uh, and so we pray this in, in, in his name, and this we pray, amen. What we're doing uh, over the last couple of Sundays is we're thinking about our ministries into 2018. And uh, last week we had what we call our Consecration Sunday. And, and that's a, uh, a time where we formally pledge to next year's ministry. For us, that's uh, ministries in 2018, and we do that, uh, it's, it's both practical and theological at the same time. Uh, practical because it helps us plan, it helps us plan financially, it helps our, our, our finance committee, uh, last week our finance chair, Travis Miller, talked a little bit about our ministries here and what, what our pledge when it comes to our annual budget each year does to help us plan. We don't, we always want to be just a tad over what's comfortable. And, uh, and so it helps our finance committee and our ministry heads not to go too far out and over plan, not to under plan as well. And so it's, it's very practical for us. It's also practical for you when, when it comes to writing something down and contemplating and, and prayerfully discerning uh, what's best for you and what's best for your family when it comes to, to growth. Uh, at, at the same time, it's uh, theological. Uh, the most frequent example or analogy to describe God's interaction with people in both the Old Testament and New Testament is the analogy of a marriage. A and if you've ever been married, you know that marriage is a daily thing. It's a daily commitment. But there are these formal days that are more important than just the average or just the daily, something like an anniversary. And normally what happens inside of a marriage with a couple is on that day, that day stands about, uh, stands higher, it's uplifted, it's a day of, of formally pledging again to the life and to the commitment. And so we do that also in the church. Um, last week we talked specifically about financial giving and about uh, what the part of our life that we tie to, to money and that we tie to our gifts and, and what that means for us, what it means as an individual, what it means uh, for, for us as a congregation. Today, I want to look at the flip side of commitment. It's not tied to money. That's tied more to your time. And if we were to probably list the two most precious commodities in our life, at least when it comes to subject matters, one would be money, the other one would be our time. And to be more specific with our time, that part of our life that involves our mind, involves our hands, uh, and our, our giftedness, to use a language in the New Testament, maybe, maybe the better language would be a, a God-given skill set. Uh, because that's also what we pledge when it comes to a life of, of faith. And, and the goal at St. Paul is always for everybody participating in ministry. And however that plays out into whatever ministry that plays out, the goal is everybody that calls St. Paul home, we want people growing in grace, participating in, in ministry, because there's a reason why. Faith, whether we talk about it inside of an individual or faith inside of a community, is never meant to be stagnant. As if to say, I have faith and I have faith and, and there it is and it's always the same and it never changes by nature, faith is dynamic, it's fluid, which means it moves, it grows, or at least has the ability to do that. And what I hope to do today is give you three reasons why 
what you do with your time when it comes to committing that to the life of the church, why it's important. First and foremost, what you do with time has the ability to affect another person, help lead to transformation of another person. And the idea is that we do things inside the, the community here, uh, the life here, and we, we either give of ourselves or we create things, and then that, that has a way of affecting another person. And so the, little, the cards that you have uh, in, in your uh, orders of worship, this one that's in here that says faith and love has everything to do with your time. And so what we ask you to do is we ask for one, we ask you to commit to pray for the church, the life of the church, the community, pray for our ministries, pray for the people that, that will be affected by these ministries, whether they be here inside this building, whether they be inside of the, the larger community here in Columbus, or, or whether they be the ministries that take place that St. Part has the privilege to, to, to be in connection with all around the world. We want you to pray every day to pray for these, to, to commit to pray for these, maybe even join different groups that, that have a responsibility in the life of our, our church to pray. Their community needs that, that are presented to us, needs of people, sometimes they, they let us know, sometimes they don't, but we, everybody needs prayer. If you think you're beyond that, you're fooling yourself. And if you don't think that's the case, and you, at least you don't, wanna, you don't know what to pray for, who to pray for, and you're just looking for a place to start, pray for me. I promise you I need it. We all do. We all need the prayer, and we all need the practice. And when you pray, what you do is at least two things. You, you uh, create an environment where God can intervene. You've heard me talk about Maxie Dunham. Maxie Dunham was the president of the, one of the seminaries that I attended. And, and Maxie, uh, for long, maybe the last 60 years, has been a heavyweight inside of Methodism. And, and Maxie said something one time in a chapel service when I was uh, at Asbury Seminary that I've has always been just at the forefront of my mind. And I've, I've wrestled with this all throughout my, my ministry. He, he said, either God cannot or God will not until people pray. And when I first heard it, I thought, this sounds sort of heretical. You know, God cannot. You know, we believe that God is omnipotent, that God can do all kinds of things. I mean, the idea that God would be limited by, by my prayers or your prayers or our prayers. But experience in ministry has told me that's about right. That if something really does take place when the community comes together and prays. And so maybe it's just that God will not until people pray. And so when we pray together, when we pray for, the, for God's kingdom to come, we, we create an atmosphere for God to intervene inside the life of other people. Not only do we do that when we pray, when we pray, what you do is convey to another person they're not alone. We fear isolation. That's why for some of us, growing older, we resist it one of the reasons why we struggle with death because death is a reminder of what that we can be alone or we might be separated and so we run from that um you know what's interesting to me is if you visit people who are living a life in just in that season of their life where they're more isolated than in previous times Watch what happens when they come together with another person. Watch what they do with their hands. They touch, they rub all the time because it's a reminder that they're not alone. 
And when you pray, when you pray for other people, what, you, you, you actually are loving them. It's an act of love because not only do you create an atmosphere for God to intervene, you say to them, you're not alone. At least at this moment, there's one other person who is remembering you, who's thinking about you, who's loving you. So much so that I'm willing to take that to God. And surely you can do that. So whether you pray in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, in your car, we don't care. We just want you to pray. To pray for the life of this church, to pray for for people, to pray for yourself. Not only pray, the idea of small groups. Now for us here at St. 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 Paul, small groups sort of revolve around three different issues. They can be groups that are tied more to education. They can be groups that are tied more to, to fellowship and, uh, and then groups that are tied to maybe service and, and, uh, and ministry. But the idea is that when we give ourselves in some group, in some fashion, what we create are faith relationships so, that are different than normal relationships. The relationships that you form here have woven into the very core of them the idea of your faith and another person's faith. And what that does, that creates trust. Do you know how people change? It's two ways. People change one or two ways. They either get to a place of pain in their life that's so great, they'll do any and every and all to get rid of the pain. But that's not the norm. Maybe the better way to describe that is say when someone hits rock bottom. But that's not the average. The average person changes when they're involved in a relationship where there's mutual trust between the parties so that the life that they're presenting to everybody else and the real life of of really who they are, they feel comfortable enough to let this down So their real authentic self can be shared with another person and they're not worried about rejection. That's how a person changes. That cannot happen without relationships that are built on trust, that have faith as a core component of it. Which is why when people change, the first step is honesty. Do you know how hard it is to be honest with another person? That's why we're so good at lying. People get too close to you and they start to sense the real nature, maybe some of the things that we struggle with. We we don't want to share that. So we just present something else. But what if we were to create an environment here through relationships where people felt comfortable enough with a small group of people so that they actually could could, could showcase the inside of their stomach and realize that that can be trusted. To live that type of authenticity. Well, for us, small groups. That might, be in a, that might be in a Bible study, it might be in a supper club, it might be in a Sunday school class or, or, or a short-term study, maybe six, eight, ten weeks. All of it is designed to create relationships that are, that are bonded together with faith. For some, it might be serving in a way where you use your time for different age-level ministries like children or youth or adults. The idea is to create experiences so that different people can have certain experiences that become catalysts for them. It's like the vow that we took here for James Michael. Do you think he's going to remember that? He's a daisy if he does, that's for sure. But you'll remember it. Which means every time you see him, When he's growing up from a little baby to a toddler to to a young boy and then eventually into a teen and then into a man, you'll remember that and the vow you take. 
that says it's my job then when I see him to live in a certain way that presents Christ. Well, that takes people who are committed. Not just to a vow today. That takes people who are committed year in and year out. But some will say, Shane, I can't do this. I'm not qualified, right? You know, God qualifies the gift. I, I think God, I think the only thing that God requires is just a willing heart. You, you remember the name C.S. Lewis? Some of you might. C.S. Lewis back in the 1900s, heavyweight, uh, a black belt uh, missionary to India. And when he was uh, growing up in his own church and, and, and wanted to kind of step out in faith, and, and, and so someone put him in a situation where he was going to lead this group, and this group had his friends and his family, and he's there, and he's going to teach them and, and talk to them for a little bit. And, and, and he gets up, and he realizes about two minutes in, it's just, it's just not connecting. And so he says to the congregation, I'm sorry. I've forgotten everything I'm supposed to say. And so he steps down and he walks to the pew and about in mid-walk, he hears this little voice that says, why don't you just tell them what I've done for you? And so he stops. He turns around and he says, obviously, I'm a terrible preacher and a teacher. You are aware of that. He said, but let me tell you what I do know about God. And he begins to talk about his own life. Well, when that, when that uh, service was over, everybody in the service left. It'd be great. It'd be a wonderful preaching story if they all came down to the altar and mass revival, you know, and the church grew by 10,000 on that day. They all left. Save one. This guy's waiting over in the corner for everybody to leave. They came by, they shook his hand, thanks for sharing, and being helpful and encouraging, and then they all left. And, and on his way out the door, this guy asked C.S. Lewis, said, will you just do something for me? I heard what you were talking about, and, and I'm sensing some of that in my own life. Would you just pray for me? So C.S. Lewis writes in his journal, he, he prayed for him, and, and the guy leaves, and he leaves, and it's about a year later, he, gets, he doesn't, doesn't know the guy. A year later, he gets a letter in the mail that says, uh, just want to kind of give you an update. I'm married now, and my wife and I, we're moving to Africa to be missionaries. And the guy said, when I look back on my life, one of those major stepping stones that helped move me to the place where we're at today was that night. He had no clue. Now, I'm not saying God's going to take you to Africa. He might take you to Ukraine. Not Africa, maybe, who knows. India, worked for C.S. Lewis. But see, the idea is we think that we have nothing to offer and we discount the work of God inside of our own life. And so when you give of your time in various ways that are listed in here, what you do is you help create an environment that God leverages to help change another person. But not only does it affect others, it affects us. It's what I call the boomerang effect. See, we think that by serving and doing these things and helping another person, and, and that's, that's primary, but yet there's this part that God leverages in what we do that ends up changing us. So when we pray for someone else or pray for the ministries of this church, what we help create is a rhythm of life that beats more to, to the music of God. Can't get that without praying. When we study, when we serve, when we put ourselves in groups, what we're after is what I call reflective learning. It's one thing to learn about the Bible, learn about theology, learn about life or another person, but the goal really is to take what's, what we learn objectively and, and apply it inside of us, subjectively. Reflective learning. So it's not just something we know, it's something that we live. 
to know it firsthand. Maybe the best example in the New Testament is John chapter 4. Jesus is talking to this woman. We know her as the woman at the well. And, and, and they, first she's learning. She's having a conversation with Jesus. And she takes that learning and then she applies it to herself, to her own life. And she leaves and she goes back to, to the village. And, and people see a change inside of her. And the way the chapter uh, develops is that the community goes out to meet Jesus. And they say they're first going because they see this woman. They see And there's a life of another person inside your, your own life. And so when we give of our time in this way, whether it be caring with others, whether it be through education or small groups or, or prayers, we help create this bond, this relationship that we all need for health. And then the last thing, verse 13. Not only do you help supply the needs of others, and it overflows with thanksgiving. And you glorify God by your obedience. Glorify is an interesting word in the New Testament. It has a twofold meaning. For one, or at least one part of the meaning is to reflect or demonstrate the image of something else. So the idea is of a mirror. You shine something in a mirror and it reflects that to, to, to something else. But it also means to add to someone's character that it doesn't already have. And the idea is that you add the nature of Christ to your own character and then you reflect that nature out into the world. John Piper said, uh, he's the creator of God, uh, Desiring God Ministry, he said, birds are made to fly and fish are made to swim. He said, but we people were made to glorify God and that's our purpose years ago uh, I was involved and still am to some degree with the ministry that's part uh, some of you know it's Emmaus walk to Emmaus it's, if you ever read those upper room devotionals that we put out in the church it's the same group that that fought, took the upper room devotionals and then they created this discipleship weekend and they have it at age levels adults it's called Emmaus uh, youth is called chrysalis. They also have, that's the Protestant side. They have it on the Catholic side as well. And, and I, uh, years ago, I used to serve on these, either as a lay person or, or as a clergy person. And I'll never forget when I, one of those I was serving as a, a spiritual director, sitting in the back of the room and, and the way the, the weekend is designed, there's different, you know, there, there are different talks. People give a talk and you have a little reflection time around a table and, and the person uh, gave their talk and there's a little reflection time around the, pa the table and there was this one table over here and there was this table over here and, and about midway through the reflection time, this guy over here, and I, 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 I know his name was Mike, can't think of his last name. Mike stood up and said, uh, I don't really know what's going on. I'll tell you what I do know. I see this guy over here and I know him. I know his character. I, I, know, I know his nature. All I know is I want that. And so however it is or whatever I need to do in order to try to get that, that's what I want. That's giving glory to God. And it makes a difference. I'm asking you to commit your time to the ministries of this church next year because it makes a difference in the life of another person and it'll make a difference in your life it'll boomerang back and it'll give glory to God we can't do what we know God wants us to do without you and that does involve your time so I'm asking you to pray I'm asking you to commit. I'm asking you to serve. Over the next six to eight weeks, we go through this discernment process. Some of it has to do to, to discerning financially. Some of it has to do with your time. But I'm asking you to give yourself to this and to the life of the church so that God's kingdom comes. God leverages what you do in order to make a difference. So may it be for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
Let's pray. Oh God, in this season of, of discernment, where we look at our own life and we look at the, the ministries in the next year, and, and we know that it, it's ministries day to day. But there are these formal days where that, that stand out and we consecrate them and we, and we, we, we ask you to make them holy and to, to make them stand out. And then this time of consecration, even with our time, with our minds, with our hands, with, with these things that you've given us that, that when we look in our life, we know they're, they're effective. We just want to use those in a way that gives glory to you. And so over these next days and weeks, burden us in these areas. This we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to take your hymn books and turn with me to hymn number 102. Now thank we all our God. I want to invite you to stand as you're able as we sing this hymn together. Hymn number 102. <laughs> Thank you.